Okay, so hey everyone, this is Brent Johnson with Santiago Capital. Um, I'm here with my friend uh, Marin Katusa again today, but the tables have turned a little bit this time. I'm going to be doing most of the uh, asking of the questions. I'm going to try to get some information out of Marin and put him on the hot seat a little bit, which, you know, I know he won't have a problem with, but, you know, I always enjoy these conversations to begin with. I read a lot of research. I read a lot of books. Uh, you know, I'm always listening to different people's podcasts. I try to absorb as much information as possible before I come to my conclusions. And every now and then I'll read a report that I, even if I don't agree with it, I'll read in a report that I think is so good or so well-written or so insightful that I'm actually mad that I didn't write it myself. Um, doesn't happen that often, but every now and then it does. And, and inevitably when it does, I always reach out to whoever wrote it. Um, but in this case, you have written a whole book that I'm actually mad that I didn't write. Um, and I think that's what we're going to talk about mostly today. Um, you know, I was uh, lucky enough to, to be able to read an advanced, I guess, screening or copy of it. And uh, perhaps it's changed a little bit since then. But, um, you know, it's, it really deals with some of the stuff that we've talked about before. But before I go any further, why don't, why don't you just give a quick little background of what the book is? And then I'll dive in and um, ask you some questions and give you my thoughts on it. And kind of we'll, we'll kind of beat this thing to death a little bit. Thanks. Yeah. So where this came all about was, you know, I tried to use if you're going to lock me up into a room um, and force me to stay home, I try to make it as productive as possible. So, you know, my first book I wrote while I was, you know, the bulk of it while I was recovering from heart surgery back many, many years ago, and that became a bestseller. And with obviously with COVID, you know, the first month of COVID, you and I were, you know, talking daily, you saw some of the big moves I made in the market, and we had incredible scores. But I also realized that, holy crap, I gained like 20 pounds that first month, like, you know, uh, COVID-20 type of thing, right? COVID-19 pounds in the first month. And I decided, hey, this, this is not good for me. And number two, I'm obviously having a lot of success in what I'm doing here. Why don't I try to write out my thoughts and see what the second order effects are? And that's when I came up with the rise of America, which is a very anti-theme right now in the markets. And uh, while I was in quarantine and open disclosure, many, many, many bottles and late nights writing this book, but it's very original as you read. Um, and it's very different than everything else you're going to read because that's my style. Uh, I try to be an original thinker and that's how I've been able to stay ahead in the investment world is, you know, as Wayne Gretzky says, go to where the puck is. So that's kind of, you know, uh, the rise of Amer America, the, you know, remaking of the world order and it's out live now. So I'm very proud of it. And I've done it my way. You know, the first book, you got to kind of listen to the publisher because you're a nobody and you have no street cred in the book world. Well, I've got a big following now, I'm already bestseller, and I did it my way. It's the same publisher who's got the number one bestseller right now with Dave Gogans. Uh, and, and they think there's this is probably going to take that out. Um, and I've done the writing and the style. Uh, the publisher's like, hey, your book's too long. Hey, I don't care. I can do what I want. So it's 416 pages. Plus there's a bonus that no book's ever done before, which is the forbidden chapter. Um, and I think it's going to cause a lot of hate, a lot of it's, it's a contrarian book. It's outside the box and it's going to make a lot of people feel uncomfortable, but that's how I know I'm probably right. So um, it is what it is. Got it. Got it. Well, you know, I mentioned that uh, sometimes I read a report that I, I'm, you know, I'm jealous that I didn't write, but I have to say, like, I'm actually jealous of the hair and the beard here, too. I mean, you've got the you've got the aging <laughs> rock star thing down perfectly. Oh, only if that was so true. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let's let's get into that. And, and listen, you know, part of the reason that that the book struck a chord with me is that, you know, I, I to a certain extent, I guess, have this uh, this uh, contrarian narrative and. Um, and, and, and idea of how I think the next few years are going to play out. And I, you know, to the point you made, I, I kind of tend to agree that there is this, I don't know if a false narrative is the right way to say it, but I think people have, have, have adopted the current narrative and extrapolated it out into the future without putting any kind of a probability on it continuing. In other words, they, they've said, this is what we're having now. It is absolutely going to guaranteed, you know, it's actually guaranteed and it's absolutely going to, you know, go this way for the next several years. And I, I have understood a lot of the points that these people are making. I have just tried to tell them, listen, if that happens, okay, let's be prepared for it. 
but it's not certain. Nothing is certain. And I think one of the, the, the big, you know, you mentioned the name of your book is Rise of America. And, you know, it, it sounds kind of silly, but that is very contrarian right now. Like the, 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 the thesis right now is that America has hit its zenith. It's on its way down. It's got innumerable problems that it can't solve. And as a result, you know, get the heck out of Dodge. And, you know, from my perspective, I acknowledge the problems, but I think people are missing many of the advantages as well. And I think you've done a good job of highlighting what those are. So, you know, why don't you kind of highlight what the, the, the top issues that you think they are, and then, and then we'll dig into them a little bit in, in, in each of them. Look, America's been a bully. I'm Canadian, so I'm allowed to talk about this stuff, right? We're friends with everybody. I've been to China many times, been around the world many times. As a Canadian, we're kind of like the guys that everybody likes, right? So I've got a very unbiased view. And remember, I'm the largest financier in the in, in precious metal sectors in the world. So I've got a very different view because generally speaking, Brent, if you like gold, you hate the US dollar. And I remember you were at one of my conferences in 2015 and I stood up and said, hey, we're gonna get the negative interest rates and the US dollar is gonna do awesome and gold will also go up. And a lot of people are like, I remember my buddy, Doug Casey's like, Marin, it's metaphysically impossible for interest rates to go negative. And most people think linearly. This is the whole problem that I tried to explain with how the investment world works. They look at you know, how charts work and, and that's not how math works. That's not how the real world works. That's not how compounding works. It's not linear. And you know, when you look at from a US dollar perspective, you look at uh, the demographics perspective. I use a very cold, hard truth. And I think that's a lot of the reason why I attract so much hate within even my own sector in the media. I say what is, and I really don't care about the spinoff effects because I'm not trying to sell anything to anyone. I don't care. I'm not an investment banker. I don't take fees from these companies, but people take this show me now perspective and our market more than ever is this such a short time frame, and people forget about the volatility of the markets, what, you know, black swans, like what happened with COVID and all these things and how to protect yourself. But the fundamental irony of, you know, whether you look at from investing from a macro perspective or the micro perspective of trying to pick stocks is how things change and people don't look at the data. And, you know, the hottest copper company on the planet was financed here in my office. And I remember five years ago, it wasn't even getting a $20 million market cap, 20 million. And today it's touching a billion and a half and nothing's changed other than perception. And I can tell you company after company of, of that. And what people have to realize is there's a narrative that they want to believe. There's a narrative that they're directly participating in. And then there's the real global narrative that keeps changing and you have all these dynamics moving around with it. So in the book, I really break it down from, okay, where do we, how do we get to where we are here from a monetary standpoint, explaining the Fed, who everyone's trying to end the Fed. I've got good buddies that are funding and end the Fed. Well, I couldn't think of a worse thing to do when you actually look at the, the perspectives. Why not understand what the Fed is doing rather than fighting it? truly understand it and, and position your clients, position your family's net worth to benefit from it. Because trust me, the world would be a lot worse of a place if there was no Fed right now. And, that, and that's a really controversial comment to make, especially for a gold guy like me to make that comment. Number two, you look at the technologies that are making, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have, you know, green energy wasn't mm, economic. You better believe it is today places like Texas or the Saudi Arabia of wind power, there's going to be an industrial revolution like nothing we've ever seen on, on a, an American perspective and also in a European context that are gonna negate the manufacturing advantage that China has right now. And I explained all the data, the math, and why this is going to happen. Then you look at the demographics, again, sticking to the numbers, all of these things are really supportive and everyone thinks America's you know, the happy days, the fawns, the Elvis, that America's best days, the golden age is behind it. I'm saying, no, that's farther from the truth. America's golden age is ahead of itself. And yes, there's never been more division across America. There's never been more distrust in, in the government and the media. And it is a low point, but like any battle or any fight, it's not linear. People have to understand that this is a very cyclical motion. And, and I get into the hardcore data of where China's at and, and, and the emerging markets. And we get into the swap lines like you and I have talked about. And, and you know, 
this isn't just you and I talking about these things. Some of the smartest finance minds came back to me and what you said about when they read something, Tom Kaplan reached out to me. I didn't reach out to him. And he's a brilliant mind. He's the world's largest collector of some of the most valuable art in the world. He's, he's just a good guy. And, and he wanted to pick my brain on these things. And what I'm trying to do is provide this really misunderstood, archaic kind of black box stuff and put the puzzles together in an entertaining way in the style that I write and, and make it kind of a, a fun read for people to have a different perspective than what they're going to see on their feed on Twitter. That's kind of the, the, the end point saying that, hey, there's a lot of guys that are pushing agendas and it's wrong and here's why. And time will tell. Like what we're saying right now, people aren't going to like it or support it. But in five years, they'll say, oh, crap, that was the golden beginning of the rise of America. Well, so one of the one of the things that I, I think is kind of interesting is, is um, you know, over the last, let's call it, I guess since, since Trump, when, when Trump got into office, he was obviously well liked by one side and, and hated by the other, right? And so the, the, I think it's fair to say that, you know, Fox News was very pro-Trump and most of the other media outlets were very negative Trump. And, you know, what, one of the things that I thought was interesting is that, um, you know, this whole term whataboutism came up is that you know, the, the left would accuse Trump of doing something. And then the right or, or the Republicans would say, yeah, but what about when Obama did it? What about when, you know, Bush did it? What about when Clinton did it? And so this whole whataboutism argument came up um, that you couldn't use that when, you know, it was a negative thing. You can't say what about, let's just deal with Trump. And my take on it was that is ridiculous because it, it's hypocritical, right? You can't just you can't just use that to, uh, I guess, obviate or, or eliminate the sins of the other side. And w the reason I bring this up is that it is kind of controversial to think that America's best days are ahead of it, and that the America will be able to weather the coming storm. I, you know, I, you and I, you know, that I think there's going to be a storm coming, and you know, it's the the current narrative is that the U.S. is not going to be able to withstand the storm. And certainly not better than everybody else. And 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 when I people will show me, you know, the U.S. monetary base, the U.S. debt, the um, you know, the social unrest, all of these things, and I, and then I will say, well, what about the social unrest in Japan or or I mean in Paris? What about the the monetary base of the ECB? What about the monetary base of Canada? And people say, but you, what about what? You can't use what aboutism. And, and my point to them is, yes, you can. And not only can you, but you have to, because what we're talking about, it's a relative world, right? The global economy often functions, you know, one country often functions relative to how somebody else is doing, especially when it comes to currencies. Um, but it's not just currencies either. And so I think from my perspective, what people have gotten caught up in is they've gotten caught up and they see all these charts and all these graphs and all these trends. And I'm the first to admit that they don't look favorable to the U.S. But the issue is then, you know, I can show you all those graphs for the other countries that don't look any better. So why don't you talk about why don't you talk about some of the things in your book? You did a good job of not just talking about, you know, focusing on the negatives, but focusing on all the positives, you know, the, so, the things that the U.S. has going for it. Totally. So you, you mentioned Trump and, you know, one of the guys that worked for me was uh, BC's champ in chess and, you know, when Trump first went and started negotiating with China, the moves he were making were so, from a strategy standpoint, was for the Chinese going, whoa, what kind of grandmaster move is this? And then the second move was, oh, that's kind of odd. And by the third and fourth move, they realized that they had no plan. And it was like playing a child yeah. in chess. But what Trump did so brilliantly that no other president did with China up to that point was the strategy of cooperation with China, he broke that to pieces. And it was an open engagement of competition. It went from a cooperative strategy to, hey, we're going to compete. But the problem with Trump is whether he didn't have a plan or he didn't have enough time, my theory was to get elected, he had to rattle his base with, we're going to make the Europeans pay their share of NATO and Japan and the rest of the world. So he alienated the Japanese then he tried to take on China 
and you can't take on China without the other allies and the other allies shove their big finger to Trump because he pissed them off on other aspects. So Trump had to go it alone and he didn't have the strategy or time to execute. So that said, we leave that part there, but the complete competitive uh, engagement with China that we, you know, we are going to compete against you, but in what way, you know, you look at the rarer standpoint, you know, America's totally dependent on the Chinese river, but does it have to be that way? No. You look at it from a natural resource standpoint, America has everything going for it, just like the fracking. Brent, you were at conferences 15 years ago, and I'd be talking about how this is going to be a revolution. And the old crowd going, Mayor, what science fiction are you talking about? Well, look what happened there. Then you look at from a from a green energy standpoint, from a carbon footprint standpoint. But then what did when Biden took over, Blinken, Secretary of State now for America, where did he go first? Well, his home, which is actually he got educated in France. A lot of people don't know that. So he's one of them in their view. And he tried to report, repair the damage that Trump did. Then he went to Italy. Then he went to Germany. Why did he go to those three places? Well, that's kind of like the big three of the EU. And he's realized that, okay, we got to go fix our relationships with Euro. You see that there's no more issues about the payment of NATO, right? So that kind of has gone. And then what was the first thing that happened with China? They confirmed the competitive engagement. Biden is not doing a different strategy. He's taking what Trump shattered. He's keeping it shattered. He is not trying to do cooperative engagement. It's full out competitive engagement. But it, they believe it or not, whether you're the far right or the far left, Biden's team has a better strategy because it's a new group going to Europe. And it's not going to be the Europeans that are going to win this war. It's going to be led by the Americans. And we are in a G2 world, right? America on one side, China on the other, their allies lined up behind them. But everything from a balance sheet, from population demographics, from resources, from ports, from allies, from you looking from the swap line relationships, from a macro to a micro perspective, this is going to be an epic battle. But don't bet against America. And, and that's kind of the conclusion that I come up with in the forbidden chapter is going to expose a lot of the billionaires within America, centi billionaires, guys worth hundreds of billions of do dollars, how they are working against America's interests. And once the media picks up on these things and you empower the people to make these choices that the technology enables that today, uh, the, you look at the geopolitical perspective of what's going on with Taiwan, in China. You look about what happened in Hong Kong recently. The game is nowhere near done. And yet our whole financial market, my world, invest in things that China needs. That's been the narrative. And no one's talking about, you know, the eagles just ready to start launching and spreading its wings. Everyone's focused on the dragon and rightfully so. But you look at other aspects about what about the carbon price that the Chinese have created the economy. You know, China pollutes What's more you know, then all of the world OECD nations combined and all of these aspects are going to align themselves to support the rise of America. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because, again, the popular narrative and it's not completely wrong. It's not that I'm saying that they're out to left field. They actually make a number of good points. I just feel like they don't get the full picture. And so let's talk about what you, you just mentioned there a little bit about. Um, you know, the popular narrative is that we need everything from China. We can't exist without China. We import everything from China. We've outsourced our manufacturing base. And without them, we're in trouble. But what about the other way around? What about all the things that China relies on us for? Do you, do you, you want to cover that? <laughs> exactly. Right? So, so let, let's bring that back a bit, right? What's the largest growing sector in the bond market that no one's talking about? Green bonds. Let's talk about, you look at what the hugest movement just before COVID was trying to get the millennials. Greta was the face for it, but there was a huge push globally on, you know, the environmentalism aspect. Okay. So that's growing. You have green bonds growing by over 25 fold in the last seven years. That's big growth and that's real growth. So what does that mean? Well, these old white dudes running these big companies aren't going to do it because they woke up and they want to make a better world for their grandkids. That narrative has been proven that, goodwill. The UN's try to do it and governments have tried to do it. It doesn't work unless you have skin in the game. And what I really narrow down is it's going to be capitalism that really, really is the defining difference, you know, democracy versus autocracy. And, and you know, is it 
you know, democracy versus capitalism or communism. You really break it down into, okay, hold on a second. So we know we have IP. We know we have clean, cheap, I call it the three C's, cheap, consistent, and clean. Right? We have those power sources now in America. We don't have to rely on China to build stuff anymore. You have the robotic revolution. Oh, but it's expensive to build stuff. Well, actually, you've never had a, low, a bigger pool of capital. You look at what I call the ESG funds or the green bond funds that are going to support with a low cost of capital and with a, an agenda so for example, in the traditional bond market world, I wanna make sure you can pay my interest rate and you have financial covenants. It's expanded now that that's not enough. So these guys running these companies are like, look, there's over 5,200 companies. And I talk about all this in the book, 5,200 companies, over a billion dollar market cap on the US and European stock exchanges. Just under 500 have announced making plans just talking about reducing their carbon footprint. Well, they got to go do that. Well, how are they going to do that? Why are they doing that? Because it's about cost of capital. They're not doing it because some old dudes talking together are going, hey, this sounds good. Let's let's make this cleaner. But they didn't think of that before. Well, the technologies weren't there to make it economic. And secondly, you weren't getting benefited in the markets to do it. But hold on a second. If your cost of capital from going to like a green bond would be better than the traditional market because it costs you less money to build these things, and you commit to it where, you know, for example, an ESG bond, you have to meet your uh, commitments on emissions. You got to meet your commitment on the social governance aspects. Like, for example, a lot of companies are doing billion dollar bonds, but by 2030, they got to reduce by 30 or 40 percent emissions, have 40 percent female workforce, include the indigenous people in their areas and, 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 and empower this growth and commit to all these things that they say are social governance, but actually commit to it with the numbers. Well, they're doing this because then they can commit to it, get lower cost of capital, increase the shareholder cash flow, and they got skin in the game. If they don't meet it, their cost of capital goes up. That's just one of the aspects that I'm talking about. And then you look at the spinoff effects of all of that. And, you know, there's this misconception that every gadget needs to be made in China. Well, because it was cheaper. But with all of these forces aligning now, are you going to buy something from China if it's going to be cheaper in America and you get it here faster? No. What about if you knew not only is it cheaper, it's better made. You're not using shitty steel. You're using, you know, American steel and you know, it's going to be a better design and you know, guaranteed that it's high paying jobs in America with robotics and they've had good low footprints and clean rather than bringing it, you know, from China. And it hit me during COVID my wife, you know, we, in Canada, we, we our, our officials have handled this horribly, and it's just reconfirmation that politicians are absolutely useless and they'll never solve any problem. But we weren't allowed to go anywhere. So, you know, you're relying on Amazon and all these, you know, delivery services. And my wife ordered a whiteout and it came in a box like huge. Yeah, so yeah. I was at the front door and I thought it was going to be big. So I, it was it was like the opposite of hurting your back. You know, when you go to pick something yeah. visually yeah, that yeah. you think is going to be heavy and you and I looked at this and all this packaging for something the size of like this. And I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on here? Think about the carbon footprint of that. And you're telling me I can't get that from a manufacturing facility here in our backyard, yeah. clean, clean, and, and high paying jobs. Of course we can. And we're just at the start of this revolution. It's And people think, oh, yeah, well, that ain't going to happen. OK, they're the same guys that said fracking isn't going to work and technology is not going to work. If you're betting against the rise of America, you're betting against human ingenuity and the American dream is alive and well and it's better than ever before. The difference was the, the framework was, OK, let's use China as a engaging cooperative strategy where we can offset our costs. Now China, the dragon has arisen. It has its own geopolitical agenda that works against America's. And now it's in a situation where think about it, over $500 billion a year of goods trades on platforms like Amazon, Walmart. Hey, it's made Jeff Bezos and the Waltons worth hundreds of billions of dollars. But what's the true cost of this cheap Chinese manufacturing, right? If you look at it as a, as a mathematician studying actuarial sciences, you, everyone recognizes that, you know, just the amount of concrete that China consumes every year, year over year, 
it's emissions from that because the way you make cement, it's a one-to-one, -one, uh, every ton of cement produced from limestone equals one ton of carbon dioxide. They consume so much concrete, more than the rest of the nation, all the world's uh, nations combined, that it equals all of the cars on the planet, their carbon emissions combined every year, just from their concrete consumption. So you can't put the tax on the people. And number two, you can't expect China to pay for this because they're manufacturing the thing. But what's going to change this is the technology and the economics and give the people the power. And I explain a full out strategy on this. Now, one of the three people that read the, 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 um, the forbidden chapter, obviously, was the publisher and her husband works at the DOJ. They, they share the ideas and he's like, can you come and talk to us about this? Because this is something we've never looked at. And I know that once this goes live, Brent, look, I've done a lot of things in mining, a lot of companies where I was a founder or director and created thousands of jobs. On my, you know, when I'm long gone, no one's going to talk about those things. It's going to be what's in the forbidden chapter. It is what's going to be what my career will be known for. So you, can you give us a little hint on, on what it is? Or is that, is that what you were just alluding to just a second ago? That's part of it. And it's much deeper than that. Like it is okay. a very deep, it's a book in itself. And rather than publishing 800 pages, that's why we did the QR code. And it's the of everything I've ever published. And I've been doing this for a long time. And I've written a lot of stuff. Uh, it is by far the best piece of work I've ever done in my life. And, and, and look, I'm not here to sell books. I really don't care if people buy it or not. It's a way to get out there. And I come from, you know, when I first started in the academic world, there was a saying publish or perish. But one thing I've realized about publishing is the amount of deal flow and the amount of people you meet by just putting something out, out on the internet yeah. it is incredible. Absolutely. And from yeah. guys, like, think about how you and I connected or, yeah, with anyone in the industry, you know, Tom Kaplan uh, got something referred by some fund manager, the largest gold fund manager was watching my swap line thing. And then he contacted me by putting it out there in the world. I know I'm going to share insights. For example, we all know about the hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars in sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and, and different, you know, pools of capital. But has anyone ever broken down in an MPV or an IRR cash flow analysis, the carbon footprint price in their financial models? No, I haven't seen a single report ever on this. So I, in the book, I explain to people how to do this. Remember, I've got the advantage of being a math guy. So I explain. Now in Canada, Alberta, which is the Texas, you know, uh, of Canada, refuse to acknowledge what the federal government mandated carbon credits. This is just one aspect of the forbidden chapter. They went all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost. Now, you know, my copper mine has to buy, it's essentially from a government standpoint is a tax on carbon, on your emissions, but that's just, you know, there's different categories. There's S1, which is direct uh, carbon. S2 is indirect and you have S3. So you look at these financial implications that no analyst has modeled because they're kind of the old school. They don't believe in this. Well, it's becoming mandated by law. And when all of this millennial capital comes in and mandates as a shareholder, we want this, that's going to force the corporations to accept this. We've just scratched the surface on this. And mark my words, you know, in, in mining, it was a big thing when we switched from data to IFRS. And, you know, how do you uh, account for a stockpile? Is it low grade stockpile? Is it medium grade? Is it high grade? So I was involved in all this stuff because I was, you know, building third, Canada's third largest producing copper mine with Jimmy and Rod and the team. And I was there from day one and I watched the evolution of all this. And it was a huge game changer, these little things to your accounting balance sheets. But what happens when the new accounting standards make it by law that that's a liability? What happens to your pre-existing investments? You have a chance now to calculate all that and be ahead of the curve. And that's how you become a successful investor, be ahead of the herd. Well, let's, let, let's take a step back a little bit. Um, we, we, you mentioned this a minute ago, uh, and, and I, want, I want people to really kind of understand this because there, there's two ways that you can, um, I think, uh, engage with, 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 with the book that you're going to write, uh, or you, there, there's two different perspectives. One is you can, you can believe it's absolutely true. 
The other um, is you can think it's partly true and partly wrong. And the other one, you can just think it's completely wrong, right? Now, if you think it's completely wrong, then you may go out and you may, and, and I'm bringing this back to people who are managing their portfolios. So I know a lot of what you do is to try to help people ultimately protect their wealth and grow their wealth. And, and that's a lot of what I do as well. And so if you go with the, if we go back to these three possibilities, one completely right, number two, somewhere in the middle and, and, and three completely wrong. If you are betting on number three, that's completely wrong. And then you go out and allocate your portfolio thinking that it's completely wrong. You can get completely <laughs> wiped out if it's right. And, and the point I that I like to make to people is I always use Tom Brady as the example. Tom Brady is the, uh, the Super Bowl winning quarterback. He's won like seven or eight, I think it's seven Super Bowls or eight Super Bowls. I, I can't even remember anymore. And, you know, he used to play for the Patriots. Now he plays for the, for the, for the Bucks. But, you know, for years, he, a lot of people hated the Patriots and hated Tom Brady. Um, and, he, and even when he went to the Bucks, they still hated him. Um, but the guy just wins, right? He just wins and wins and wins. And sometimes they were accused of being cheaters. And sometimes they were accused of using, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, morally incorrect, you know, strategy or whatever. There's always this, you know, persona around the Patriots and, and Tom Brady that, that they didn't quite do it the right way, but they still won and won and won. And, and, and I think what happens is people get their emotions of who they would like to see win and bet on that rather than who's actually going to win. And so, you know, you, it, it's fine. You mentioned early on that the United States is a bully. I completely agree. Um, you know, the, some people will label us an empire and evil and even an evil empire. Again, I'm not gonna argue that point. It's, it's kind of uh, irrelevant in my perspective, but it, let's, let's just say for the sake of the argument that they are the evil empire. Well, if you're going to go up against the empire, you're welcome to be a revolutionary and you might win. But revolutions very rarely do, right? And so even if you hate them, even if you hate what they're doing, even if you think the game is rigged, if you have the ability to bet on the game that's rigged, why wouldn't you at least take part of your portfolio and do that? And even if you can't quite get to that, that's fine. Maybe you don't want to bet on the rigged game. Again, I'll allow that. But are you going to put 100% of your portfolio betting that the rigged game is not going to work out in their favor? And so uh, maybe you can address that a little bit, because I think there's a lot of people. And, and listen, I love the gold community. I think in many ways they, they've done a fantastic job of educating people about the dangers of fiat currency, the need to have some alternative assets in your portfolio, you know, the protection against fiat currency losing its value over time. All that is fantastic stuff. The problem, I think, is, is a matter of degree or probability. People will hear this and then they'll go put 80% of their portfolio in junior mining stocks. There's a place in your portfolio for junior mining stocks, but it, it's kind of the all or nothing that, that kind of scares me when I think of other people's portfolios. And it's why I've tried so hard to kind of educate people on probabilities. Maybe you could touch more. on this whole topic. <laughs> Maybe you could touch on this a little bit and, and, and talk about, again, you know, whether you're completely right or whether you're wrong, you know, I happen to believe you're right, but it's a matter of how do you allocate your portfolio once you start to think about these things. So the key of what I think what I did here was, uh, even though I wrote the book, I sent, uh, there's four people in the industry I picked, four completely polar opposite personalities. You were one, three other individuals, and I got them to all go through the book in the process that I did with you, which I thank you many times for, and I mentioned you in the my acknowledgments, and the three other individuals were all came from a very different perspective and light. And what I wanted to do was get your guys' comments. And it's kind of like, you know, the, the old uh, Isaac Newton saying, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And, you know, I didn't really invent anything. What I did was I was able to I'm kind of like a, a very good puzzle piece. I, I put the puzzle together and you gave me some really good suggestions that I didn't think about. Uh, Worth Ray, who I've got millions of dollars with him and Mark Hart gave me uh, suggestions that I didn't really think about because I come from a different light. And as you absorb the pushbacks, what I tried to do is make as mathematical based data-driven de uh, uh, decision 
And I talk about the advantages that China has right now. I talk about the advantages that Russia has. Remember my first book, the last page I talk about America's future will be off of the foreign policy and next president. Did I have any idea Trump would be? No. But when I wrote that two years before Trump was elected, it all came down to the foreign policy. And again, we've gone from a, you know, an engaged cooperative policy with China to a competitive engagement. Now, asset allocation, how do you go about doing that? And, And I've talked and written about this so much, and I give actual examples in my appendix and why it's 414 pages of, look, man, I was the largest financier of this stuff globally. I built my career on it. If anyone knows the good, the bad, and the ugly of this industry, it's me. And I talk about my mistakes, but I put it in the appendix, not in the body of the book. My publisher was pushing back saying, hey, you know, this is only going to, you know, maybe 5% of the reader is going to read the appendix and all these math formulas and all this stuff, the MPB, IRRs. And I go, that's exactly who I'm rooting for. Because when I started, I knew nobody. I come from immigrant parents. I started with nothing. I didn't know anybody in the stock market. In fact, I didn't know anybody investing in the stock market. I grew up in East Van. Okay. So I, I sit there and I go, okay. And you learn to respect everyone. Because remember where we come from, Canadians are the good guys. We're, we like everybody. And I grew up in a very multicultural, East Side, hardworking people. It's wild. It was where the poor kids grew up. And today those houses are shacks worth over a million dollars. It's funny how <laughs> changes happen to Vancouver. But anyways, happen. as a side note, you get into these lessons. And, and, and this book is for me and you 25 years ago before we knew anybody. Like I already know that what I'm doing is going to shock Jeff Bezos to his core. And I know he's going to read it. And I know that this is going to have effects. That to me, you know, it's it's wild, Brent. Like I, when I go out to, you know, my wife's friend's social engagements or my child's school, everyone's kind of knows who I am. And they kind of give me this, oh yeah, you're a miner, you're a bad guy. And I'm like, does everyone forget that I was the second largest shareholder of Canada's largest green energy company? And I was on the front page seven years ago about that. No one gives a shit about that. They, they focus on this. So now I want to be, okay, what do you do for a living? How do you say I, I finance copper mines and gold mines? People like what you just make environmental disasters. Mining has such a horrible thing. I'm like, well, actually, I finance the you know the the innovations in this technology. People don't care about that, right? Okay. And and where this is going, I think the the opportunity at the end of the conclusion that I get at this this arbitrage gap between you know buying stuff cheap from China. And closing a blind eye to the human standards, the pollution on the environment, the living standards of the sweatshops and all that, because things were so cheap. You know, think about uh, Katie Gefford had, Kathy Gefford had more negative press than anyone else than Nike today. But think about all the factories and the harm and all that, because the social aspect of it, Jeff Bezos is now worth hundreds of billions. The Waltons combined are worth hundreds of billions. But what about the future effects of everything that's happening that you can now quantify mathematically and with science to the core and, and the arbitrage opportunity of, hey, we can make all that here without those future impact costs of the pollution and the cost of capital for that five years ago, but it went really high. But now with the green bonds, they're dying to find investments like that. And the mindset of the board of directors is finally changing because the pool of capital is forcing that change because of cost of capital and never, ever bet against a capitalist and an entrepreneur with a solid arbitrage economic opportunity. Now, I'm not saying don't bet against companies, but the spirit, the American dream. And and it's wild how many people think from a social aspect that the U.S. dollar is trash. Okay, go travel to Moscow. Go travel to Cairo, go anywhere in the world. They don't think the U.S. dollar is trash. Go to the Turkish lira and see what they would rather be paid in. And and I get it that the average American, especially in the crypto community, where you and I had that incredible call with Mike Green, who I think is a fantastic mind. I love big minds and big ideas. And no one's talking about, well, why are they selling as many as they can and they're taking U.S. dollars? Where are those U.S. dollars going? What's happening in the, the, the second order effects of that stuff? So we are on a dawn of a massive change. And what I'm trying to do is give it from the perspective of a guy who spent his career flying around the world, financing these things. And you look at what's going on in Peru 
and Chile and Ecuador and you know Colombia and all these aspects to where you know there's an old saying in mining that gold cre uh, God created gold but the devil spread it around and you know it being the <laughs> I've devil. I've heard that one. Yeah, that's a good one. It, I need to remember that one. Yeah, uh, my buddy Greg Smith told me that years ago, and I always thought that was a cool saying. And you know, being the devil, he's going to spread it in a devilish place. Yeah. And and you know, I put body armor to go evaluate wells and all this stuff, and I'm sitting there going. I've made my biggest scores on simple strategies of just playing that ARB. And I didn't need to put body armor on. I know it makes a lot of this junior mining stuff and, and, and these wild crypto stories and all it, it, it makes for a great story from newsletters and, you know, the Indiana Jones of investing and it's exciting. And the average person who's unhappy with their job reads this copy and they visualize themselves going through the jungles Trust me, yeah. I'm the guy who actually did that stuff. And, and, and it's and, not, and, not quite as romantic as it sounds, is it? And it's really hard to build a mine in the middle of nowhere with no infrastructure yeah. and the indigenous yeah. people don't want you. And in some places, I remember when we went to PNG, the guy's like, Yeah, last time I was here in 1978, and they would eat people. You're like, Are you serious? <laughs> These things that you can't even fathom. So, I walk through asset allocation and my framework and, and how you go about buying and the biggest mistake people, they, they like an idea, right? And they go, my portfolio is 50 grand. I just signed up. I'm going to 50 grand at once into one stock. Yeah. You're like, whoa, right. time out. Yeah. Hold on. And, you know, if I, when this is all said and done, I'll probably teach this class to, as like a charity to universities or something. I hope it gets picked up. I've been asked a lot by you. You know what I think? Too. I, th I think that's a fantastic an idea. And, you know, one thing, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help you with it. So maybe when it's out there, maybe we pick one chapter and we, we do a whole conversation on that chapter. And then we do another chapter and we do a whole conversation on that chapter. What, what, what I really want people to take away, I, I cannot recommend the book enough. And, and it, again, I don't really care whether people ultimately agree with you or whether they disagree with you. And I don't care whether they ultimately agree with me or whether they ultimately disagree with me. What I my goal is to get people to think a little deeper than the narrative they've been told and 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 keep an open mind. Some of the best reports and some of the best ideas that I've ever uh, been involved with came from a paper I initially hated or that I initially didn't like, but that presented information in a way that I had not considered. And it forced me to kind of, you know, take a different view. And so, so my recommendation to anybody that's even slightly interested in geopolitics, capital markets, investing, you know, social, uh, social issues is to read this book and keep an open mind because, you know, the, the, you know, my, one of my favorite movies of all time, actually my favorite movie of all time is Lawrence of Arabia, right? And the, the famous scene in there where he crosses the, the desert that can't be crossed. And, you know, once he gets across, you know, he says nothing is written, right? And, and my point, and, and I say this a lot, nothing is certain, nothing is written. And it's really true. It's very, it's very possible I end up being wrong. It's possible you end up being wrong. It's possible everybody else is being wrong. But it's possible that the person reading it and disagrees with it is wrong too, right? Keep an open mind, read the book, consider its implications. Um, regardless of, again, regardless of whether, where you end up deciding your opinion lies, you will be better for having read the book than not reading it. And, and the absolute takeaway, in addition to what you're getting at, is understanding when you're making bets, investments, understand is it a speculation or investment? I break down the differences there, but also the time frame. What is your expected time frame? What is your risk adjusted analysis? And the key is to say solvent. This is not just from an investment standpoint, the companies you invest in, can it stay solvent until your thesis is right? So many failures have their thesis right, but they weren't able to stay alive to reap the rewards. You know, they say you pick right, sit tight, but you've got to be able to sit tight long enough to yeah. get the benefits of seeing that. And so many guys in the industry I know were worth hundreds of millions of dollars, flying high. And they allow, and I, these are things I talk about in the book. They, they, you know, they got into, I call it, they went Hollywood. I talk about this aspect. And, you know, when management teams go Hollywood and they forget what actually is their core and their style and through debt and leverage, you know, leverage is 
totally. I, I think Brent, if one thing is totally misunderstood in this market is the th the death of leverage and truly using it. And look, I, I, I talk about my past and, and what you know the points of my career where most guys would have blown up, but the difference was the leverage, understanding leverage, staying away from leverage, and the companies you know who who blow up because of leverage. And, and, you know, just staying to the core principles, but staying alive. Look, just mathematically, would Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger be Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger if they were, you know, 90 and 96 or however old they are? Yeah. Um, you have it compounding without the time frame is not compounding. Yeah. And these are just the right. simple principles that universities forget in their case studies, because, again, it's taught by people with no skin in the game. And yeah. The game is changing. And, and if anything, Brent, I, I think, you know, people, you know, I've got family members and friends of kids, kids, sons of, you know, friends of mine. And they say, ah, but, you know, Marin, it's so much easier when you started out. I say the opposite. Look, it's not easier or harder nowadays, but the access to information has never been easier. You know, in my living room, you can Google pretty much anything and everything. It's there on YouTube. You can access to an information. In my days, I had to go through the old microfiche, you know, yeah. the libraries, and it was on that plastic, and I had my whole team go through it, and you have that light, and it blinds you. You know, it, you couldn't just Google and download charts and access to data as spreadsheets the way you and I remember when we were doing that last yeah. April and I was putting together all the data and yeah. just dumping data. Back when I was starting out, we had to go to the microfiche oh, yeah. to put all that Literally, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So oh, yeah. where there's a desire, there's a will. Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I'm not saying it's easier, but access to information. And, and because of that, it's also almost so easy to get led astray with catchy, hooky marketing, with narrative and personalities that are yeah. so full of shit. And, and their track record is horrible. And But they're... They have a good presence and, and they're marketed right. And it's just like, hold on a second. But when you get into that, you know, time warp and you get down into it, it's consuming so many people and so much capital that you know, I'm just trying to say, you, you, hey, here's a different view. Well, that's the other thing is, you know, you know, I, 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 I continue to think that, that the current narrative, while it's not necessarily wrong, it's, it's definitely not 100% right. And, and, and it's not the whole story. And the one thing I would say is, you know, stories are extremely powerful and there's nothing wrong with the ability to tell a good story in order to get across a point of view or to teach something new. And I think your book does a very good job of this. I think the thing that I want to keep coming back to people is just because you hear a good story, it doesn't mean you allocate 100% of your money to it. The story could be 100% right. Even if the story is 100% right, it's not wise to put 100% of your portfolio in it, right? Um, if you think the story is a little bit right, or if you think the story helps you understand something, that's fantastic. And maybe you, you know, you do the analysis and you come down that, you know, this is a speculation, but it's, it's one worthy that's betting on. Maybe you allocate 10% of your portfolio to it, but you don't put hundred percent of your portfolio into it. Right. And I think, I, th I think that, you, I think the book has done a good job of touching on, you know, five or six different major areas of, of America. Uh, and, and the advantages that, that, that those areas have against the rest of the world. And I think if even one, if, if the people that, that read the book, if, if, if even one or two of those advantages strikes a chord with them, I, I think it will help, you know, them kind of understand the world in, in a better way and, and hopefully uh, help them allocate their portfolios in a better way. Yeah, like in the book, I talk about cryptos. And look, I've got millions of dollars invested in that sector, but it's not where I have an advantage over everyone. And it makes up a yeah. smaller portion of my portfolio. And I explain to people, you know, I'm the oldest guy in my firm and I've got a bunch of guys that work for me. And, and one today was telling me about how um, he was talking to his cousin and all their buddies on a chat line and they're a hundred percent crypto. Yeah. And I said to my, one of my guys here, I'm like, Oh, is it like Bitcoin, Ethereum? Cause you can see the trends from the thought yeah. leaders about when they pile in, then they present yeah. and the flock comes in and, and they're like, Oh yeah, it's, it's not just Bitcoin, and Ethereum. It's, it's coins that are new. And these guys are like a hundred percent of their portfolio is cryptos. And, and it's, you know, you sit there and go, okay, you know, I've seen that in the mining. I saw that in the tech stocks in the in the uh, early 2000s. And, and you look at it and you go, okay, you know, look at the agenda, what is going on? And, and they don't know better because it's it's a self fulfilling prophecy. It's going yeah. hot right now until what? It's like yeah. a turkey on Thanksgiving. It's just yeah. 
it's binary. And we talk about those types of expectations. You're like, I've made the sins of the past, whereas I was all in on my stocks. I remember, uh, you know, my old rock and roll days as a gift to all my bandmates and my family and friends for Christmas of 2007. It was the first time Bon Jovi was coming back to Vancouver in 25 years. And I thought it'd be a really cool thing to get the owner's box at the Pacific, uh, at the uh, GM place where the Canucks play, Bon Jovi's coming. So I got the double box, you know, it was the biggest one in the stadium, invited all my friends and family, covered the cost for everybody. I remember just sitting there going, man, does it get better than this? You know, like I've made a ton of dough. I'm not even 30. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there going, this is great. I made it. And well, about a year later, I, I essentially went insolvent by losing 93% of my net worth. My copper company is about to go bankrupt. Yeah. had to sell my place. I'm looking at all this going, what happened? I was just at the, like, I was rocking out with Bon Jovi, Jovi you know? And I'm sitting there going, uh, yeah, it's called reality. And and I learned the hard lesson. And and and, and the lessons about, you know, I luckily, I met my to be wife at the time when I literally had nothing and I wouldn't give up on my thesis because I rechecked my thesis and we built our net worth together. But it's that lesson that I think a lot of the investment world today hasn't seen. And and let's be totally fair though, too. A, yeah. a story or a narrative is just perception. It's a point of view. And what I really tried to do was balance it out from a China's perspective, from an EU's perspective, from a U.S. perspective, because as a Canadian traveling around the world, part of my success is to be able to look at different perspectives from different angles. And what I tried to really, the takeaway is going, hold on a second now, what if this happens and we lay it out and I try to bring analogies to the past where people think that, you know, it's a for sure thing. And then what about how do you calculate for probabilities? You know, simple things like in the mining sector, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about how analysts for something in, you know, Ecuador or DRC or Argentina have a 5% MPV. Well, just off the bat that it's going to cost the company more than 5% capital, cost of capital to build that mine, but they're only reducing it by 5% as a, on your MPV. How does that work? That means there's zero risk associated to this analysis, but you're going to tell me that something in Argentina where money goes to die is the same risk as something that's permitted in Nevada or Idaho or BC? Not a chance, but that's how, the, why? Because about 80% of all the money being raised in the, in the sector is for the emerging markets and the investors, the bankers are making incredible amounts of money on this traditional way of financing through fees and fees, broker warrants and fees and cash, where if they raise 150 million bucks, the banking firm gets about 15 million bucks. Are they there to support the stock? Then of course the slick guy in a suit, yeah. you know, is gonna say, Oh yeah, we're there. Bullshit they are. Okay. They're ripping around in their Ferraris and private planes and all this shit. And the shareholders take all the risk. Okay. And all I'm trying to do is I've never worked for one of the big banks. I'm not a suit. I own lots of nice custom made suits, but you know, I, I it's not my thing. I, I guess I have that chip on my shoulder from a Croatian immigrant who, you know, did well in this world. And I don't need to play the system or the game. So I'm just being who I am. And the book is written that way. Well, listen, I think uh, the, the book comes out later this month, kind of towards the end of May. Uh, you know, I can't wait to read the fate. Even though I've already read the, the, the pre-draft, I can't wait to read it again because I know there's some new stuff in there. I hope how cool of a else. title, uh, how cool of the front page. Uh, that was my wife who came up with all those uh, ideas. Uh, you, yeah. You've seen the front cover, right? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna and, be and I think it's going to shock a lot of people. And hey, yeah. at least we're going to get a reaction out of people. Uh, and, if anything and, and else, that, we'll that, get that. that in it, and that in itself is valuable. Yeah. So, <laughs> good. Anyways, well, buddy, hey, I'm I look glad forward to talking to you again. It. Yeah, talk to you again. Stay soon. well.